Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of I Like to Read with me, your host, Rachel Polanski. Um, Today, I am very, very excited to be joined um, by a dear friend and professor at University of Vermont, um, Mr. Tony Magistrale. Um, Tony, if you'd like to give the viewers slash listeners a little brief intro on who you are before we delve into your work, go for it. Um, I'd be glad to, Rachel. Um, you, you, for, you forgot to mention that I was also your professor. Oh yeah, I mean he was my professor, and that's how we that's how we know each other. But now you're just my friend, so. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> and this is when you were. This is before you were an alumna when you were an right. Undergrad. In 20, all the way back in, I think it was 2012. I started in 2012, but I don't think I took your, the first class I took with you was the American horror film okay. class. And I think was my you sophomore year. Seminar. You took the seminar too. Yeah, that was, a, and I took that one. I took the Stephen King uh, film and television, or the book and film adaptation class, which a oh, lot of, really I noticed a lot of that in the book, which we can talk about. You're a real veteran. <laughs> a, l- a little bit I you know I'd like to think it, it was only two I think and then Lizzie says hi by the way shout out to Lizzie and uh Chelsea Chelsea says hi. Chelsea days I still keep in touch That's with nice. both That's of great. them good to good to hear from both of them uh okay, yeah so, so t- <laughs> um, you wanted an intro I'll, yes I'm about to start my 37th year at the University of Vermont wow. I know uh, well, I was such a young Turk when I first arrived there. You know, <laughs> it was a real 37 years, and you've been there for just consistently that long? Um, uh, there were a couple of sojourns to uh, work as a uh, visiting professor in Germany and in oh. Chile, uh, as well as a couple of sabbaticals where I left the country for a while. But, you know, those, those only come every six years. So... Um, other than those, uh, wow. other than those aberrations. That's crazy. Yeah, always at Vermont, you know, uh, when I was younger and had a lot more hair. Uh, <laughs> I love the goatee, though. I love the, I feel like a lot of people are doing that in quarantine. I love it. Yeah, it was my wife's idea. She no, said, it's a good look. <laughs> my boyfriend's growing out like a pirate beard, basically. He has like a mustache and like a whole, I think it's a lot of people are doing it. Why not? Well, I've got, I've got some of my colleagues calling me Captain Jack. I was going to say, it's very piratey. I like it. So. I, I, I thought that uh, yeah, that was appropriate <laughs> for all sorts of reasons. Okay, so uh, during those 37 years, I've taught um, geez, a, wide, a wide variety of courses, but um, all of them kind of circling around the topics of, of gothic fiction mm-hmm. or film um, and centering especially on the works of Edgar Allan Poe and and Stephen King. Um, I've just finished uh, the first draft of a book on uh, Edgar Allan Poe's great- Is that the first one uh, officially dedicated all to Poe that you've written? Oh, no, no, you've written a few, sorry. You've written so many books, I'm sorry, I don't have your whole repertoire, you know, right right Uh, next to me. Just a second, I'll get the CV. Hang on. <laughs> right, let's put. Let's just go through a brief history of Tony Magistrale. That's. A, we should just rename the book Tony Magistrale in American Show History. That off. Show that off. Right. Yes, <laughs> we'll be talking about this very shortly. One, it's it's very. I don't know if I'm bad. You know, we got lots of highlighting, lots of notes. I read it like you know. It's I haven't read an academic text. It's very. It's very it's, clear that you've been trained properly. Yes. Um, I'd love to talk. I recognized a lot of stuff, especially from that Stephen King, the later class I took in this book. Um, well, let, me, let me say something about the co-author of that book. Yes, please do. He's also a UVM grad. Oh, I love that. So in that's the, how you met? In the early 90s, I was his professor, both in, as an undergraduate and as his, uh, for his MA. That's amazing. And then he went on to get a PhD from Michigan State. Uh, and uh, went to Japan for a year, wrote a book on the connections between American horror and Japanese horror, oh, which is a really good. interesting Yeah, I want to check that subject, out. You know, sub, uh, subset of, the, of what we're talking about. And then uh, we stayed in contact all through this because, you know, we just liked each other uh, of course, personally. Yeah. And, 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 you know, he's just such a bright guy. Uh, and finally, he just kept pestering me. He said, <laughs> we need to write a book together. We need to write a book deal. And I said, well, okay, but on what? Uh, and and what? of course, 
you know, you know how this was going to turn out, right? How it was going to narrow. Out. <laughs> yeah, um, wonder what we'll talk about. And and eventually we 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 found ourselves centering on Stephen King rather than Poe or the Gothic or, or film. Sorry, that's my dog. No, no worries. My cat <coughs> might pop in or out. We'll see. No worries. Uh, and and uh, we we chose we chose this particular topic because both of us have always been interested in. Uh, King's relationship to both high art and low art, mm-hmm. and we thought this was a good way of mingling this 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 ability that he has, like like Stanley Kubrick, for example, yeah. to to blend um, high intellectual thinking and and art with um, popular subject matter and contemporary subject matter. Um, and what happened in the process, I was on a sabbatical, which mm-hmm. been, I don't know, maybe two years ago, I was on sabbatical. And um, we just started playing around with ideas that connected all of these things. And eventually we came up with some startling uh, interpretations that I, that, uh, that I would have never found on my own, Rich, because I needed, I needed to be prompted. You needed someone and else. Needed, and I needed Michael's intelligence. Uh, to help guide me towards these issues. So it was really a collaborative process Absolutely. throughout the entire book. That's Absolutely. amazing. Yeah, and, and of course, now we've got this wonderful testament to both um, the way in which the best things happen at UVM, but also the way in which uh, friendship can evolve into scholarship. Totally. I mean, I think that's, that's so amazing that he just, you know, you were his mentor and now you both have, and it's not, you know, even featuring, like you both have an equal stake in this book and that's amazing. And it's. Well, my, my name comes first. Uh, well, first. you know. I am, I am the elder man. Right. Of course. Of course. Michael's, Michael's got another 35 years of his own. <laughs> then he can be the, the, the starting title. I, my, my years are dwindling. <laughs> Well, we've already, we've got many more, hopefully, you know, fingers I, crossed. I hope you're well, I hope you're um, I'm, you know, maybe in five years, there'll be like some robot immortal cure anyways, you know, who knows? That's what I'm always thinking. I'm like, where you know, at this point, I mean, a year ago, like who would have thought we would be where we are today? So, you know, when people are like, where do you see yourself in five years? Even before all this, I was like, I don't, like happy, you know? And so now I'm just like, let's take, <laughs> we really don't know. <laughs> living the standard right exactly you know we just we don't know um so yes your new book stephen king and american history this came out just like a few weeks a month ago oh yeah i think it's about very recently two weeks old and i'm a very fast reader so even though it isn't you know it's under 200 pages it's very dense though so it did take me two days but (laughs) <laughs> I gave it a lot of thought. It was really fascinating. I think I, I think that's a good sign. Right. If you mean, I wanted to devour, even though it's, I read a lot of, I mean, I read a lot, I read a lot of nonfiction and, but more sort of like sociocultural personal essay stuff. So I haven't read like a really intensive academic text in a while. And of course it was nice to revisit it in something that I also am so passionate about. I'm a horror movie lover. I'm a Stephen King lover. Um, and to see a lot like you said uh, some things explored that haven't really been explored before. Um, so if you want to, I'd love to know a little bit more as I'm also like working on my own nonfiction writing and figuring that all that out, like how does your research process work? So obviously you collaborated with Michael on this, you all had these ideas and you have, you both have your own intricate histories with Stephen King and your own thoughts and feelings. But how does all of that, especially when you're working with multimedia, when you're working with so many books and so many different films, how do you, how do you sort your ideas how do you really work all that into what we have today that's a that's an excellent question um so again again i come back to that earlier point that i made to you about how michael prompted me in a lot Mm. of ways here um mike michael's very political uh and and he's got a a a real acute sense of american uh history and american politics um and and that we, we we started the book where where the book begins. That's why the first chapter is on of all things pet cemetery, right? Uh, because you know I mean, who would have expected us to start with a, a book that's in the middle of Stephen King's career and that has received already so much critical attention, right? And the reason I think we started there is because we began to realize 
that there were a lot of things in both the novel and the film that hadn't been talked about properly. Yeah, like there, um, for those of you who haven't seen the film or read the book or read Tony's book, um, there's, uh, if you want a brief synopsis, is there's a new family that moves into a rural town um, and they have a young son slash daughter in different adaptations who is accidentally killed and then the repercussions of that reverberate um, with the help of a neighbor. Um, There's a Native American burial ground. Um, I won't give maybe too many spoilers, but um, I think for me, what I found so fascinating in that chapter and that concept specifically was the idea of the Wendigo and contrasted, I know you also have a background in Gothic and horror and just the European vampire and how those are kind of symbolic of American versus European ideals. Um, And that's something that I had never really thought about before with regards to Pet Cemetery. We focus so much on like the cat that comes back to life and the relationship with Judd and forget his name, the other guy. Uh, You know, Uh, Ellie. Ellie, yeah. So I think it was, yeah. So sorry to have interrupted you, but I think that's like stuff like that, where it's like you have a background in other ideals and then you're bringing it into, and he has his American history stuff. And then that all com- culminated into something that we hadn't really heard before in academic history. So all of that, um, on its own, all of that has already been part of what I would call the critical discussion of the novel and the film, mm-hmm. uh, with a special emphasis on its connection to Frankenstein. Mm-hmm. You know, the men, males usurping female gendered roles and, uh, and, and, and creating new life, okay? Right. Whether, whether we go back to the Micmac burial ground of the Native Americans or whether we spring forward to uh, Judd and, and uh, Lewis Creed, who are uh, very American, very contemporary, yes. uh, who, who want to keep this secret between the two of them. What we discovered in the actual writing of this chapter were some of the deeper elements that have not been talked about. Like, for example, the role of Route 15, Mm. the actual highway that the trucks travel in order to um, bring oil uh, or, or petroleum products to the town and perhaps beyond the town of Ludlow. Uh, and that one of these trucks eventually kills the child and sets all of this in motion. Uh-huh. Um, we began talking about issues like, for mm-hmm. example, um, what's the what's the importance of oil to all of to to all of this in a novel and a film that deals so much with things that are buried, right? Ancient, archaic things that are buried that are resurrected. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, that has all sorts of implications to it as well. You know, given our, our historical reliance on oil, our continued reliance on oil, the manipulation of oil companies uh, and their, well, let's just call it their um, influence on American political and military might. <laughs> yeah, to say the least. You know? And, and then it also connects back to the idea of going into places where perhaps we do not own. Mm. You know, who owns this oil? Like who owns that burial ground where um, people are returned from the dead? And so this became this wonderful nexus for us to start thinking about the way in which not only what's underground gets resurrected, uh, both in terms of bodies, quote, mm-hmm. the vampire tradition, right? But also in terms of the whole history of America's involvement in oil and war. Right. This, was, like... this was Michael's big c- contribution to this chapter, the cyclic, the cyclic nature of war in American history mm. and how we can't seem to get away from it and the way in which it somehow forms an unholy bond with our, so many of our quests for oil, uh, you know, whether whether we, we talk about World War II and um, the fact that the Japanese could have probably taken out more than the American Pacific Fleet if they had just gone a little further and went after American oil reserves at Pearl Harbor. Mm-hmm. They neglected those. 
That's history, what history that's would have been very different. Yes. Would, well, it certainly would have been more convoluted and difficult because the 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 Pacific Fleet was rebuilt in two years, but those oil reserves, <laughs> you know, w- really fed the war, uh, the American war against the Japanese, at least in the Pacific. I mean, it still probably would have worked out the way it ended up working out, but it would have been very different in terms mm. of how it worked itself out. Right. So that that became that became this wonderful way of thinking differently about because how often do you do you discover that what Stephen King's work is really about is uncovering things that are buried. Mm. Yeah, so that's this is a major theme in King's work. Of course, it's crucial to Pet Cemetery, but it's also inside those novels, like for example, uh, The Shining. Yeah, where what's buried inside of Jack? Yeah, what's buried on the surface on so many different levels. You know, it's not just the ground; it's inside people. I mean, even like the end of Carrie, you know, rising up from the grave. Like, uh, there's there's some element of buried in any sort of yeah. any sort of his works. Um, yeah. so, even even I don't know if you're familiar with one of his uh, his newer adaptation called um, 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 A Good Marriage. I don't think I am. When did that? Up. When did that come out? It came out, I think, about three or four years ago. Oh, okay, I'll check it out. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a good novel, but it's also a pretty good film, and mm-hmm. it's about you know it's about the BTK killer. Oh, interesting. I hadn't. I didn't, has that not on my radar because I love true crime too. You would love this. Yes, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, novel slash novella slash film. Mm. Uh, and and it, it's about the unraveling of the BTK killer's domestic life. Right. Because he hid himself first. He buried his true self for, for many. And he was undone by such a stupid error. <laughs> so leave, it, leave it to Stephen King to want to probe that. Right. That's uh, amazing. Or what, what, what lies beneath. Right. And it's not very often that he delves into sort of action. I mean, he touches on American history and real life situations, but that he delves into an already existing character. So that's also an interesting thing to think about. Um, go- I, I recommend it to you. Yes, I definitely, I'm going to, I'll put it down yeah, on my to read it, list. I, I think you could probably get it on Netflix. Oh, it's, so it's a movie and it's a, a novella. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's a, it's a, there are, no, there are no real stars in the film. It doesn't matter. I, sometimes those are better. Like, I don't, I don't know. Actors. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, and with The Shining, too, talking about things that are buried. So back to the to the book. Um, uh, <laughs> on page 64, um, for anyone who can see, there's an image of a woman in the infamous ballroom with a handprint, a bloody handprint on the back of her. Now, mm-hmm. I've seen the film five six yes um and i never noticed that and so it's the little things that are buried in you know of course it's a kubrick film but it's you know still in the king canon um and just little metaphorical i i wrote never noticed exclamation point um but and then how that's just representative of the history that we're overlooking and the violence that we're overlooking because we're so focused on you know jack and wendy and danny but we're really you know it's it takes many viewings and years of probing thoughts to really think about what are those things buried so like what was it like i mean i know you've written about the shining before i know you've talked about it a million times everyone's seen it um like what was it like to really revisit that in a new way and dig into it um something that you've visited countless times before yeah uh again i think um i want to i want to have to come back to that first chapter uh, on on Pet Cemetery, that initial chapter, because that got both of us. I, I mean, I think it got both Michael and my juices going, in terms of saying we want to do something that's never been done before in this book. And Which you accomplish it, so. I, I I really I I think that's what's so interesting about this book. I'm hoping that uh, publishing it with a great press like Rutledge will have a good audience out there. Um, to to look at this and it, and it comes mm-hmm. and in paperback too right uh, for an rather, academic uh, text very rather on the than affordable side right thirty dollar hardcover right yeah putting it out in paperback so it's affordable and and Rachel I think if if I had to say um, the theme that runs through this this text this this analysis is again probing things that have not been probed sufficiently mm-hmm. like for example 
Stephen King in the Vietnam era. There, there's, uh, there's been nothing that has been written about King's relationship to the Vietnam War. Which is crazy because he literally like grew up during the Vietnam Absolutely. War. It's a foundational part of his life. Absolutely. And people just don't talk. Yeah, and then also the queering of Stephen King too, which is not really talked about, and which was a very fascinating analysis in this as well. And people avoid, people avoid the queering of Stephen King because I don't think they want to offend him. I mean, he's become, no, he's become a, an American god. Right. And, and people think of him, and you know, you, you're familiar with the, the Trump war that he's got going on on Twitter. Of course, yes. And, and, you know, we think of Stephen King, and I think rightly so, as a highly progressive, uh, politically astute individual. And yet, as we point out in that chapter, there's a lot of stuff that Steve needs to correct. Right. <laughs> he's his, not perfect. He's not perfect. He's interesting, always interesting. Of course. But and I think... That's part of what makes him who he, I think if he was perfect, would we re, would he be the same person that he is? No. Like he he can't, everyone's got their flaws and some are, I mean, he's not straight up homophobic per se, but sometimes, you know, if by not include including things or by what you do choose to include, it can be perceived as well, problematic. But what do we, what do we do with writer, with a horror writer who so frequently affiliates homosexuality with monstrosity. I know it's, it's difficult. I mean, especially apt people, which um, I had just seen the film for the first time in your class um, with Brad Renfro and Ian McKellen. And that is just like absurd. Like, I mean, this young teenager is like fetishizing this, this older man who used to be a Nazi and their weird sexual relationship. And it's like, how could you not look at that as prob? I mean, that one I think is, you got to read it that way. You yeah, can't. you can't. There's, I mean, you could, there's certain other instances, maybe like even the Green Mile, you could, or the Shawshank Redemption, where there's the prison aspect, and you could kind of understand where he's going with that. It's part of the culture. Um, but it, yeah, the Apt Pupil, which I I find it a fascinating film. I mean, it's crazy, but it's almost, it's, it's not very, it's, you could excuse it as like, oh, it's not much, it's not very much like his, some of his other things. So it's separate, but it's, it's still part of the canon. It's still important. It, it, it's also, we're also back to that theme that runs through our book. Mm -hmm. What's repressed, what's buried beneath comes out. And even, even a character like Pennywise the Clown and it. Yep. Who, who you don't think of in terms of, of, of sexuality in any way. Uh, or, for that matter, gender orientation, and yet, um, in so many instances, Pennywise is linked to a kind of abhorrent sexuality slash homosexuality. Actually, with that very obvious, like the parade in the beginning of chapter two, and yeah. in the film, and it's the very like like the opening scene where these two men who are gay are just quietly living their lives, and all of a sudden, one gets eaten by Pennywise, and it's like, why do they have to be again? <laughs> I mean, certain things like that, where it's like, in a way, I could see him looking at it as like, well, I put in a gay character. Look, I am including them, but again, sometimes not always the best. And, uh, and, the, and the flip side of that too, Rachel. That while homo, while homosexuality is affiliated so often in his world with monstrosity, there are so few homosexual characters that are viewed positively. Right. I was just thinking, like, are there any really like lesbian characters in his novels that I can I can't really. I mean, there's maybe some women who are coded as lesbian, but I can't think of any like specifically overt ones. No, no one overt. Which is crazy. Yeah, especially since his daughter is gay. Oh, I didn't you, even know. Yeah, you would think that <laughs> he's sensitive to these things. Right? right. And it's like, again, like we've kept saying, like bearing, you know, the act of not talking about something, we can compare that, to, I mean, it's more to race. And like, the you know, I don't know if you've read Tennessee Coates' um, uh, article, The Case for Reparations. Um, it is fantastic. I know and, of the article, yeah. Right. And so some, you know, by denying our history, we are, that's, that's not going to solve anything. We need to bring these things up to the surface. We need to acknowledge them. That's the only way we're going to change them. And so again, if he, by not including them and then the few instances that he does, I mean, it's yeah, the lesbian, I mean, I wonder, I feel like 
maybe Dolores Claiborne, like there's a little bit of lesbianism. I could all, and uh, what Gerald's game when she has her like. Always, always asexual, Rach. Right. Ace, yeah, that's the asexuality is fascinating too. And I know that it's, yep. he's notoriously been like, I don't like to talk about sex. Like I don't feel comfortable with it. And so, but I want, you know, there's a difference between being chaste and virginal and fully asexual. And that's like such a fascinating thing that he straddles in so many works. It really is. It really is. <laughs> Especially since his sexuality becomes another way of revealing monstrosity right? in so many of his... Right, uh, there's so much rape and sexual abuse and especially with fathers and young children. I think that's the parental units are very um, not... He he destroys the nuclear... There's really not many nuclear families in any of his novels, which is another, you know, back to the American history component. You know, that's the two kids, the three and a half kids and the white picket fence. Like if there isn't a symbol of that in his story, it's usually not what it seems. Which brings, which really brings us back to the whole Vietnam experience, right? Yeah. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about that. What sparked that? Um, I know, like there, like you said, there really hasn't been any critique or work on it. But um, I know you explored two texts specifically in this chapter, but it can really be applied to <laughs> any of his works. Yeah. Just, I'd love to l- learn a little bit more about that. Um, we we started off by thinking, okay, we're talking about American history here. <laughs> uh, what's the other than 9-11 right. what's the big event in American history that would have affected Stephen King now we've got Dreamcatcher and we've got Hearts in Atlantis which are the two texts that we go into great detail on because those are explicit texts that deal with the Vietnam experience and that have very seldom been talked about yeah, I have to guiltily. I have not read either one, but I feel like through your analysis, I was able to really understand. And that's what that's what makes a great writer, and that's what makes a great book. Is even if you haven't read the text, but you're familiar with sort of the canon as a whole, you can still understand and get. And now it makes me. I want to read them. I'm going to add them to my to read list. But there's there's this context too. I mean, we've right. got a kid. We've got a young kid in college who goes to University of Maine Orono as a. Um, as a, as a Goldwater Republican and gets radicalized. He was from Maine, him. right? He was... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, from Maine. Gets radicalized in 68 and 69. Which are, like, the, very formative years just in American history in general. Joins the SDS, uh, becomes a, a, a figure who, who leaves college, and instead of becoming transformed into a serious, middle-class, middle-aged man, keeps these radical these radical ideas and at the same time feels and this is critical to this chapter feels that somehow we've let ourselves down we had an opportunity in 68 and 69 to use the counterculture to produce a different america and we blew it we blew it yeah and that is his sentiment so in a way, then, all the negative stuff that Stephen King's got to say about contemporary America, the breakdown of the family, child abuse, um, um, the failure of our institutions, from schools to churches to the government, uh, the violence and carnage that's part of our cultural inheritance, all of these things somehow become connected in a very interesting way to his disillusionment. Huh. At the end at the end of the 60s and the beginning of the 70s, instead of producing utopia, we we produ- we produce uh, dystopia. Yeah. And at least in his world, that's where that's where the horror comes from. The horror comes from a very clear historical and political orientation. Of, of, a, of a breakdown in hope. Now, that's not to say that hope isn't there in Stephen King. It is. But it's never in terms of the community. It's never in it's terms... It's about the individual or the, the, the smaller thing. He yeah. focuses on the microcosms, the macro... Um, the, I'm sorry. He focuses on the microcosms and the macrocosms are always... They're the problems. Yeah, absolutely, Rach. And, and you know, it, even that is connected to his place in time. Totally. He's a Yankee. He's a main Yankee. So he thinks like in terms of individuality. He thinks 
in terms that ironically that are almost Republican. I know. Crazy. With, with this, with this constant emphasis on the importance of individuality uh, and, 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 uh, and, and standing apart from the corruption of community and town. Right. So often the monster, it can be an individual person, but especially like an it, you know, like Pennywise is the symbol of dairy and dairy is the larger issue. Beautiful. That's exactly what I'm saying. It's exactly the point of all the, all the treatment that we give it in, in our book is, is, is precisely to make this point. Pennywise becomes the emblem, not only of dairy Maine and small town America, but also in terms of this cyclic history of violence that is part of the American history, the part of the American legacy. And same thing in The Shining too. Like when Jack is in the painting, you know, he becomes part of the twenties. Like he is that whole larger system and ideals that happened at the Overlook, you know, however, in the, 50 years ago or 40 years ago. <laughs> and notice, and notice the way Jack affiliates, as we say in the book, how Jack affiliates more with the 1920s than he does with the 1970s, which is in in real time where Wendy and Danny live. Right. And it's not so much that he's, you know, he's trapped in this sort of illusion other world, but that illusion other world isn't just like this ether. It's like, nope, it's just actually a time that existed. Just he's not on that same wavelength right now. But yearns to be there. Right. And and, and eventually if, if we take, Kubrick at his word becomes he gets powerful. yeah he gets to become and then it's crazy you know he doesn't then it you know he doesn't die he just he becomes absorbed into this different time world which is right yeah, that's word. good word absorbed absorbed yes you know that's how that's how I, I mean and I love that last shot though I mean it's it's I'm I know that Stephen King is not the biggest fan of The Shining, of, you know, not not the biggest fan. Um, but I think it's with so many different adaptations, I like to look at them really as separate works. Like I think it's you know it's Kubrick's Shining. He owes a great deal of it to Stephen King, but they're really especially you know there's key differences. I mean, how Aaron's death, I think, in the movie versus not in the book, and how things end, and how Danny is portrayed too. But I I think. Uh, the one thing that stays the same is Wendy is not <laughs> very developed in either one, but I mean, what are you going to do? Um, but, but again, it's, it's this, it's this gap in time too. Right. So, I mean, we could have easily entitled that chapter gaps in time because <clears throat> Wendy is part of a generation of second wave feminism, even though we don't see much of that in Wendy. Right, but she's still, I mean, the fact that she's able to escape at the end and maintain her autonomy, I mean, that, she she succeeds, I guess. that argument. She's a final girl. She's a final girl, yeah. She, yeah. I mean, if not for, I mean, her and Danny, I guess, but also, you know, the women and children. Like, children are not, Danny's still young enough for he's on her side. He's not a man who can contend with Jack on his own. But if we push it back to the novel, it's not the 20s. That's all, that's all Cooper. <laughs> It's the 40s. It's the post-World War II, beginning of postmodernism that King is interested in in his context. Right, and so that's probably I mean, a big reason why he may be upset about the adaptation. But that's why it's like you just got to look at them separately. They're, they're dealing with totally different ideals. I don't think it's fair to say, you know, he took the idea from it and the inspiration and yeah. he did what he wanted with it. Yeah, he wanted, I mean, there was a very deliberate effort on Kubrick's part um, to subvert the, the historical context that King was working with, right. bring us back even further to the 20s and yet say the same thing, essentially. Right, because there's a lot of overlaps in those eras, of course. In the 20s and the 40s, right. absolutely. Absolutely, a lot of overlaps. And again, the, the cyclic nature of history mm-hmm. that we keep finding repeated not only in Stephen King's novels, but also in the adaptations of films. That, right. have, that, that have emerged because of King's novels. Totally. Yeah. Um, what's your personal favorite King adaptation, whether it's in the book or not? I don't know if I ever well, asked you that. You know, Rich, I, I, I keep, I, you know, I can't, I can't. Okay. If you ha- okay, let's see, top three. I, well, I can't stay away from Shawshank. 
Sha- right. So that's where I was going to get. So Shawshank is not discussed in this book because your previous book focused entirely on Shawshank. Um, so what was it like to transition from devoting entirely everything to one piece of work, uh, particularly the film really you delved into, right? Very much so. Right. So it was, you know, a comp- it wasn't just the book Shawshank Redemption, it was the film as well. And again, I think that they're similar, but they stand apart, especially in culture as a whole as totally different mediums, especially Shawshank Redemption is a novella and it's a film. Um, so what was that like to transition? And um, if you want to talk just like a little bit of your love of Shawshank, of course, feel free. Well, I, 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 I just think Frank Darabont did such a great job of adapting what is a hundred page novel. Turning into a two, two hour, two and, hour. two and a half hour. Yeah. Yeah. It's consistently I, like the number one movie on IMDb, like in all those lists and everything. I know. And, and the other thing that I found really interesting about that is that everything that Frank Darabont did to Stephen King's novella was an improvement. Mm, right. And that doesn't always happen because after all, you, as you said earlier, it's apples and oranges. Right. What you get in one artistic concept, uh, construct is not necessarily the same with what happens in another, you know? So, um, yeah, we stayed away from Shawshank, I guess, because I think I've said what I want to say. About <laughs> you know, um, it, it was a again. You know, Rachel, you're gonna you're gonna love this, and it's gonna sound like nepotism. But the woman I wrote the Shawshank experience with was also a UVM student. I mean, yeah. it's a great it's More a great Grace. school. It's a great school. What can I say? They produce yeah. some, they produce some great some great people. Maura Grady was also a student of mine. Uh, plus, I love her name, Grady. More I know, that works they, perfectly. I had to do something like that. <laughs> you know, so, but it was great. I mean, she invited me to, uh, they, they had the 20th reunion of the show. Right, show, right. Making the film. You were going to, I think you were just going to that and you were speaking on the panel when I was in a senior college. Oh, cool. Okay, so that's perfect. Um, and, and I went there and, and did this uh <clears throat> <clears throat> this panel that included the warden. Right, right. You know, uh, I, I'm trying to think of his name now. It's awful that I warden. can't. Warden. Uh, warden Norton. Uh, right. but I, I don't I don't know his real name. I forgot. That's okay. That. Uh, Eve Lapola, who was in charge of tourism and film adaptation uh, work in, for the state of Ohio. And Ernie Killick, who was uh, the publicity person for... Um, um, not New Line Cinema, but uh, what Castle was it? Rock. Castle Rock Cinema. Castle Rock Entertainment, I believe. Castle Rock Entertainment. <laughs> yeah, and and you know, after after meeting these guys and after talking to so many people and presenting these ideas that you heard about in the classroom, you know, when I was first formulating, uh, right, you were just starting working on the book. Ways of reading Shawshank. Um, I said to Mora, who was a professor at Ashland. You, University, which is located in the, the same city where the, the, the oh. prison is. Was that so, intentional or she just happened to get a position no, there? she just happened to get a job there. Very cool. And, um, I, you know, she, she took the, the Gothic seminar with me, so she studies, she has studied Stephen King, and she teaches the Shawshank a lot. But I don't think it ever occurred to her. Uh, she was coming from, uh, she was coming from, she was coming from the film from a variety of different directions than I mm-hmm. was. She was interested in the whole notion of fandom and 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 fan theory. Which is great. Like I said, it's the number yeah. one movie. It's regardless of Steve, it's like usually people's favorite Stephen King adaptation, but then just in general, I can't even tell you how many people are just like, I've met yeah. them, they say my favorite movie is the Shawshank Redemption. I'm like, yeah. so is everyone else's. I, I got a great story for you that yes. Steve told me once a, a, a while ago. He was. Uh, he's got a second home in in uh, Sarasota, Florida, oh, okay. that he goes to in the winter time with his with his family. And he was in a Florida supermarket one day, and this little late little old lady went up to him and said, "I know who you are. You're you're the man who writes all those terribly scary stories and <laughs> makes people not sleep well at night." And King said, guilty as charged. Yep, that's what he does. But you know, I also wrote The Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> the woman went, 
You did not. <laughs> I know so many people don't even know, especially because it was just a hundred page novella as opposed to a larger novel, but it is a it's Stephen part of King a, film. Part of a bigger compilation too. Right. And yeah. it was originally titled Rita Hayworth and Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank, Shawshank Redemption, right? I was like inside oh, different God. seasons. Right, right. Exactly. Right. And was Stan, was the body in that too, or was that a different yeah. Yeah. Look, I I think, all, I look how that, well you taught me. It's all, I saw right. still up here. Oh, <laughs> you were a star. You were a star. Yeah, I, I, you're cost. I miss them so much. Well, I, I, yeah, I, well, there, there's going to come a time in the near future where I'm going to assemble all of you again one more time. One more time, yes. Yeah. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a class for all of you. Yes, that's what I miss. Like, I just took a six. years of Rachel's. <laughs> I know that's like I'd love to meet all the other, the other all, me's, and we're all over the we're all over the country and the world. I'm sure all over the world, right? Yeah, really, all over the world. I've, I've I've been so fortunate. I've been so lucky to have such great students. And you and you you taught or you studied in Italy as well, and you've studied you know internationally, so you have connections all over the and world it, already. Students, one one named Marina Sentiani. Can you can you speak Italian fluently? Oh no, I can't. I, can't. I, <laughs> I took I took Italian at UVM actually for two oh. semesters because they I had to take a foreign language, but they teach you the entire language in two semesters. So I'm like, I retain Stephen King information, the language, yeah, not so much. <laughs> but she was one of my students at, at at the University of Milan when I was a postdoc on a Fulbright, and she's still one of my closest friends. Amazing. We're very, very close. And she still lives in Italy? Yeah, she lives in Milan. Very cool. Yeah. They're doing much better than we are right now. Not to not to be too COVID-y, but, you know, the, the elephant in the room. Um. <laughs> Everyone's doing better than we are. I know. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's crazy. Uh, I wonder if, you know, he's working on some sort of COVID. Because he's written, you know, so many different, especially post 9-11, like so many different plague novels and you know sort of dystopian but futuristic in a way that they haven't been done before i'm like i wonder if he's working on a on a covid piece i saw i saw a youtube video the other day where he was uh being interviewed somewhere and he apologized for writing the stand yeah i know it's like <laughs> certain <laughs> novels it's like you look back at stuff that was you know done 15 20 years ago and you're like oh this is exactly what's happening you predicted the future basically I wonder, you know, there's got to be some people out there who, like, worship Stephen King and are like, he is our God. He told the future. Like, you know, there's there's got to be people. I mean, there's people out there who believe they're vampires. So there's got to be people out there who worship at the altar he's, of Stephen King. As you know, he's just an it's cr- And it's so crazy because he just, I mean, for all intents and purposes, is really just this, like, Yankee main sort of, you know, salt of the earth, literally guy. <laughs> and for him to just have become this huge, and I, you know, it wouldn't have worked probably if he was, if he became sort of like a Tom Clancy, John Grisham sort of airport novel. Cause these, when his books come out, it's never like mass market paperback airport novel. It's like, all right, who's got the film rights? Who's got the TV rights? It's like, it's crazy. And 40, 50 years later for that to still be happening. There's some research that I was doing the other day um, of all the writers who have had movies made of their work. Um, there's a list of top ten. And Is he number one? Shakespeare's number one. Oh. Um, and and Poe's on that list. There are over a hundred adaptations of Edgar Allan Poe's work. Uh, and the only Ian Fleming is mm-hmm. on that mm-hmm. list, the James Bond stuff. And King is on that list. He's the only living writer. Wow, which is crazy because I mean the amount of work that he has put out. And for, I mean, not all of it is great, but like oh. amount of substance, like percentage of actually good work considering how much he's put out is really just astonishing. Like, I just can't get over it. I mean, and that's probably part, I mean, I'd also love to know like what initially drew you to Stephen King? Like, I, I know you kind of grew up in a similar time. And so you have a similar um, backdrop of American history, but how did, how did it first start? What really drew you to him beyond just like the general horror gothic? I can, I can give you a literal moment. Yeah. I was, I, was, uh, I was in graduate school in Pittsburgh, and one of my fellow students by the name of Greg Weller came up to me with a, co- a paperback copy of Carrie 
1976. Which, for those who don't know, is Stephen King's first novel. First novel. And, and, and the paperback came out in 76, uh, along with the movie. And he threw a copy of Carrie in my lap and said, read this. And then it was... And I read it and I said, wow, this is really interesting. So Carrie is, I, remains like one of my top, especially because it's so interesting that his first novel dealt with such female problems and a female protagonist, and she's a monster, of course, but I do kind of admire Carrie, you know, she, she's she's kind of a badass woman for for all that happens to her, and so it's crazy that that's his foundational she brings, text. Brings the temple down. Right, she's a goddess, she's she's a queen. Yeah, no, she, she really is, she's the... Uh... Well, there are various incarnations of Carrie, uh, usually in older form. Right. It's so because she's such a it's for it to be such a young girl, and especially, I mean, I'm more familiar with Brian De Palma's film, but Sissy Spacek is just she's so young. Like every time I watch it, as I get older too, I realize how much younger. Like I first saw, it, I think in like seventh or eighth grade, so I was a little bit younger than her. And then to have watched it as I get older, I'm like, these girls are so young, and he did a pretty good job of capturing the young teenage girl experience in a monstrous way, but sort and, of. And, and yet the film still works. It's, I mean, I mean, it's amazing. It's, and he likes that film, right? He is on board with that one, right? <laughs> well, you know, one thing, one thing I remember him saying to me at one point in one of our interviews, we, King and I have done three interviews together now in the last 50 years. And one of those interviews, he said to me that the, Sometimes a barometer for reading how a director or a screenwriter understands me is how well they manage the admixture of horror and humor. Mm. I like that a lot. Frank Darabont gets that in right. uh, Rob Reiner gets that in Misery. <laughs> Misery is another fantastic, like Annie Wilkes. Brian De Palma gets that in Carrie. Yeah. This mix of horror and humor that King finds... Uh, Maybe horror. that's why he doesn't like The Shining so much is because there really isn't much humanity to most of the characters in it. Well, they, start, they start off from a base of already being crazy, whereas in other ones we get to, get to know them as a human and then they devolve. And, and there's not much humor in there either. <laughs> no, it's, yeah, it's very, it's very, I think recently some of his more recent novels have had a little lighter humorous bits to them. I read, um, was it If It Bleeds, I think, was that collection of short stories. And I really liked that because that was like a little bit lighter at times. It just felt a little more playful for some of them than his other stuff. Um, and I love short stories in general. I feel like that's also, he's so good. Like he can, he can write a thousand page novel what, however many pages it is. And then he can write a hundred page novella and they're both equally as good. It's just like, who else can do that? Not many people. I, 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 read, a, I read an interview with him uh, a few years ago where he talked about how the short story tradition still is so important to him. It's, I find, that's what I mean for myself, especially. I mean, I love reading, but for people who don't so much, you know, they don't have the time or they don't want to get into it. That's where I always point them. I'm like, you can read this 25, 50 page piece of work and it's contained and you'll get the whole experience of a novel just in a shorter form. And so I think the short story is incredibly important. And he was definitely one of, especially for horror, one of the pivotal people in pushing that out. I think he borrowed a concept from Poe. You know, po talks many things, I'm sure. Poe po talks about the importance of um, being able to read a work of literature in one sitting. Mm. In, order, in order to contain in that sitting um, the manipulation of the reader. You know, uh, Poe was all about effect. Of course. How, how, could, how could he affect a reader? How could he encapsulate a reader into a gothic milieu. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what King's fond of too when he writes short stories is this kind of, that's almost a return to a Victorian sensibility. Or, yes, it's or, very or, Victorian gothic. Yeah, or Poe, you know, the, it's certainly a 19th century aesthetic that very talks much, about yes. the, the value of, 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 of being able to sit by the fire with a cup of tea and have your pants scared off. 
Right, exactly. And, you know, you don't have to put on like a horror B movie. I mean, it's people just don't read as much in general. And I think it's it's sad. And I think that it's so great that someone who's been on the market since the 70s can still reach new readers and they can, you know, they can pick up Cujo, they can pick up Pet Cemetery, and it'll just like hopefully re I know for some people, I know that they did not like reading. They weren't into it. Then they picked up a Stephen King novel and they were like, oh, yeah. this literature doesn't have to be, you know, yeah. Charles Dickens and right. all that. That's right. And I, and I also, I also think it has something to do too with his accessibility. Totally. And that's, you know, going back to American history. I mean, he, he gets the American experience, whether it's something that, I mean, you know, you're a baby boomer, you're a millennial, you're a Gen X, whatever, like there's something for everyone. And then it's, you know, it, the readability, I think, it, or the, the rewatchability in so many pieces is great because looking at it as it stands in American history presently and then past and future, it's just like crazy. Well, you know, Rachel, I'm, I'm really, I, I know this is going to sound really arrogant and I apologize for that, uh, but I'm, I'm really hopeful that this book we're talking about, Stephen King and American History, will be part, in the future, will be part of a way of understanding that in the, in the pre- and post-millennial era, Stephen King had his fingers on the pulse. The whole time. Of, of American culture. And, and I'm hoping that this book will help to establish that and, and help people to see that connection uh, in a way that instead of just seeing him as the America's horror meister. Right. You know? And I think, I think that expectation is slowly changing, but I think, yeah, we need books like this. I think also, you know, whether or not you're in college, you know, if you've graduated or not, like it is an academic text, but it is very accessible and it presents a lot of ideas that haven't been presented before. So, you know, even if you think, Oh, I already know everything there is to know about Stephen King. Like, no, you don't. <laughs> what, do you think the, what do you think of the cover, Rachel? I love the cover. I think, like, I, I that's what I said is, I mean, certain academic texts, like, they just, you know, have, like, squares. Like, you know, this, like, this looks like a book that you would just pick up in a bookstore. I love the soft, the yeah. soft touch and the soft feel. I think also that it, footnotes are really great because they're connected to each chapter. So immediately after, you can kind of just, like, get the refreshing of the thoughts as opposed to, like, at the end, reading a whole footnotes, whatever. Um, and I think it's, I think it's really fascinating and I hope that I'm sure you'll be teaching it I hope that future professors and future I mean high school even why not high school absolutely you know I think I have have a high school teacher here in Burlington who teaches the Shawshank Redemption every year amazing like that's that's why I mean and then that gets kids into they on they can ex- they can become accessible to something that you know maybe previous books they've read have not really resonated with them, but I think that there's something in all of these that can resonate with people. Um, but they're still high literature, you know, gets such a rap for being you know he's the horror meister, but it's like those are the mass market ninety nine cents bargain bin whatever. And it's like no. But we also, you know, it goes back to your earlier point about people who, you know, we live in a digital culture. We live in a in a in a culture where nobody reads unless it's Twitter, you know, or, you know, or, or, you know, we just, have, we just avoid um, the, 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 the joys and the complications yeah. that come with uh, extended literary time. And just immerse and immersing yourself into something. Cause it's, you know, it's such a, it's such an active action. Whereas like watching TV or listening to something is a very passive action. So it really requires like full engagement. That's right. That's right. A digital and a filmic culture. That's, you know, that's our... Which I love, experience. but you got you to gotta supplement it with um, some other... All right. We have been talking for quite a long time, so I'm just going to... We'll catch up at the end of this, but for everyone listening on our end, Tony, do you have any final thoughts? Um, Stephen King in American History, like I said, is out now in paperback. Highly recommend it, whether you're familiar with Stephen King or not. Um, I think you if you haven't read any of Stephen King, this is a great place to start. Tony also has a bunch of other books out on American history, Gothic. Um, I 
am also partial to. There's a collection of Stephen King works um, by other professors. One professor, also Sarah Nielsen, who I studied with, has an essay in that book, so I'm very partial to it. Um, but any any parting thoughts or words for the listeners? Well, you know, Rachel, it's just, it's just been fun having you back. I'm so glad that we were able Next to talk. In a, in, a, in a classroom-like environment. I know, I know. Um, this, I, I, the, as much as technology has problems and issue, you know, is frustrating, this is, this is the benefits and the joys of it. We wouldn't have been able to do this 20 years ago. I know, I know. It's so. great. It's really great. And, and uh, it just reminded me of how much fun we had in, in all those classes with, I know. Uh, with you and your girlfriends. Yeah, it was so fun. Well, it was so wonderful to talk to you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. Um, and if anyone, um, I'll put Tony's information at his website and where you can buy the book in the information below. Um, so you can purchase it directly online. Um, and until would then, you, everybody. Do me a favor. Would you yeah. Put, uh, the, I, I don't know. Put the, uh, the Rutledge address. Rutledge, okay. I think that's, yeah. That's and, where and I bought it from, I think. You go to their website. And you can buy it directly from them. And I get a discount. Okay. So I'll put the Rutledge website. Or, or Amazon. I think you can also do a discount there too. Okay, cool. Well, thank you very much again. And it was so good to see you and everybody. Um, until next time, stay reading.